from this slide, this is the total budget, supposedly, this big you know, pie. Uh, Two-thirds of it is in what they call these mandatory programs. These are commonly called your entitlement programs. You know, they happen anyway. You automatically get it, you know, as long as you qualify, as long as you meet the criteria as a senior, as a poor person, uh, you know, as a farmer, you get these things. The stuff we usually talk about, however, is in these two smaller sections, the defense and non-defense discretionary. This is the stuff we actually 
uh, our budget bills or our appropriation bills. That's what we talk about. We don't really even talk about these because they happen automatically. But as you can see, this is two-thirds of your budget. So it seems like we ought to be talking about this. You know, this is a spending, this, this is the fastest growing area of our spending. It's not over in defense and non-defense. Certainly we can do better in both those categories, but this is the big deal. Next slide. All right, this is the money now. Where, how much revenue do we have? Well, we had 3.6 was the number on the other side. That's a lot of money. I'm sorry. I'm a veterinarian. You know, I got 40 bucks a visit. I was feeling pretty good, you know. <laughs> this is very different than my world, but I'm getting to, unfortunately, know about it. Uh, we only collect $2.2 trillion, though, in revenues. So we have to borrow a million four. That's 39%. This, we're borrowing 39, almost 40% to pay for the programs and services that we think we need or want. And that's just not functional. You can't do that at home, can't do it in our own businesses, so we've got to change that issue. We're growing broke, basically, at this stage of the game. And there's a couple of reasons why. Let's change, next slide. All right, this is a little wonky. I'm kind of a budget numbers guy, and I apologize for that. I'm not supposed to talk about numbers in presentations. People don't like numbers. But I think some numbers are important, just to give you a reference point. Uh, this is our, our projected debt. You know, you see, you hear people talk about uh, red ink as far as the eye can see. Okay, and there's some pretty good red ink. That way over on the far left for you guys, that's World War II, the debt we had after World War II. That was way over there in post-1945. And then, you know, we kind of got it down, but always carried debt. And now, uh, getting into the, the 2000s, we're projected on either of these two lines. What's the difference between the two lines? And this is important when you listen to folks talk about the debt, you can be a little more informed. There's the current law debt. Then there's likely what's, what's likely to, frankly, happen, according to some people, this CRFB. That's the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. This isn't some right-wing or left-wing group. This is a bunch of bipartisan legislators that... Uh, and frankly, business and labor people, some nonprofits, individuals that are concerned about what's the likely debt scenario. Current law is what our Congressional Budget Office talks about based on the existing law. The existing law assumes that the Bush and Obama tax cuts end at the end of this year. The existing law assumes that we're going to cut doctors' reimbursement for Medicare by 30%. And existing law uh, assumes that uh, the, there's going to be continued war spending for quite a period of time, not just you know getting out of Iraq or getting out of Afghanistan in a couple of years. And it assumes that the alternative minimum tax is going to uh, hit the middle class, that so we're not going to re-up the exemption we've given so far. So there are, those assumptions are probably not realistic. There's no one talking about eliminating all the tax breaks. Some of those are thought about to continue. We argue about it against them. <coughs> Uh, I don't think we're going to cut doctor's reimbursement 30%. We haven't allowed that to happen for the last 15 years since it was put in place to start with. So the real world is current law is vastly underestimating what's likely to happen in the United States Congress. So the truth is probably somewhere between these lines. But, and you can see how unsustainable that is. It's way out of whack from after a bloody world war, for gosh sakes. So it's not, it's not feasible, practical, or good policy for our kids and grandkids to allow this to happen. Next slide. Well, I think there's two major contributing factors. I'm going to challenge conventional wisdom a little bit. As I said, there's lots of things we could talk about, and I hope you'll bring them up. But there are two big things we need to talk about. One is revenues. One is revenues. The main thing from this busy slide, I, I like to go to history. 1970 is way over there on your left-hand side. All right, you can see that you know, revenues, which is this line here, has always been a little less, or almost always been a little less than the money we spent. We've always overspent a little bit. <coughs> nothing new, nothing revolutionary. The only time it didn't happen was during the uh, Clinton, uh, Perot, uh, Republican Congress years, right here. That's the only time where we had a budget surplus on an annual basis. But all these years add up to a pretty big debt over a period of time, and right now, with a confluence of circumstances, and we could argue about those, but the fact is, right now our revenues are at all time low, and our spending is at an all time high. The average revenues have been in the 18, 19% range, and our spending's been in the 20, 21% range. Right now our spending's at 24 to 25. 
and our revenue is only about 14 to 15. So there's a 10 point swing here. You can't do that. That's just, you know, 101. I mean, it's just impossible. No business, no house can survive doing that. But we're deficit spending like crazy. So our revenues are at all time low. Next slide. <laughs> One thing I didn't know about, and I learned another thing today from an uh, earlier presentation up in the uh, Canby area from some folks, but I didn't know that we actually uh, give away a lot of money to folks that lowers the amount of money we actually take in. Remember I said we collect about $2.2 trillion? Well, we give away a trillion dollars in tax breaks, tax loopholes, tax expenditures, whatever you want to call them. You know, deductions and credits on your tax form. We give away a trillion dollars. We only collect 2.2. Now, some of that's fine, I guess. Some of it we really like. But the bottom line, I guess, from my standpoint, is we can't afford it. That's why our tax rates are where they are. That's why the, a lot of the discussions about we've got to raise the tax here or raise the tax there, because we give so much away. So we've got to think differently about that. Uh, the revenues, how do we get revenues... Uh, and not create this big discussion about uh, class warfare that you keep hearing about. And I'll, I'll give you, uh, you guys ask some questions, we'll give you some ideas. Next slide. The other, uh, oh, this is important, I think. You know, who actually gets the benefits from the tax breaks? Well, the, the quintile means 20%. So we got five quintiles to make 100%. Uh, frankly, the, the more well-to-do get most of the tax breaks. I guess that's not news to everybody. Next slide. But who doesn't pay property taxes. This was news to me. You know, uh, the, most of the people in the lower brackets are the ones that don't pay taxes at all. 50% of, America, of Americans pay no taxes whatsoever. Now, I, I'm one of these guys, I, I, I believe in everyone sharing you know, a little bit. There should be some proportionate share, mind you. So on the one hand, we give away all these tax breaks up here, and then there's people at the lower end or lower to middle that don't pay anything. And as a result, middle class America is put in the tab. That's where I guess the point of these two slides are. Middle class America is put in the tab for this country. Next slide. The other piece besides the revenue thing that I'm trying to get you to think about is where is the real bad, with that curve that looks so horrible, you know, going forward from this era? Is that because of President Bush or President Obama? And all? Well, yeah, I guess you could say some of the policies there are, are, are not good and effective. But the real issue is this red piece here, Medicare. It's growing by leaps and bounds. The cost of the program is unsustainable. And it's not because of any particular malfeasance or bad uh, policy. It's just continuing the old policies we've had. It's unsustainable for several reasons. Uh, Social Security looks pretty good. Geez, that's not changing. Why do you guys keep talking about Social Security? Well, I'll show you. Social Security has its own set of issues that you all should at least know about. Next slide. All right, Medicare, uh, one of the things I always get is, well, curse rate or leave Medicare or Social Security alone. That's my money. I paid into that. You know, well, it's you and your employer paid into it. It's not really just you. You and your employer, right? Out of your payroll taxes, when you hear all this stuff about payroll taxes, that pays for Medicare. Well, there's some other pieces like unemployment, but it's both, the big chunk is Medicare and Social Security. Well, and Social Security, yeah, that is still the truth. You know, it's just you and your employer, you pay into it. After 67 years, in my case, I'll get uh, some Social Security. Uh, based on my uh, tax bracket. Uh, but for Medicare, it's not true. I didn't know this either until I uh, <coughs> get in Congress. Medicare is actually subsidized through income tax. So it's no longer just a contract with your money and your employer's money in there. It's actually being subsidized by the United States government income tax. What does that mean? That means that's income tax money helping, which appropriately, make sure seniors have good health care, well, at least some health care when they get older. But it means that's money that can't be spent for education, you know, economic development, transportation, natural resources, healthcare, whatever you, you know, well, why won't, I go, why don't, you know, in the old days, Kurt, we could do these things. Well, certainly there's a lot more requirements, makes it expensive, but the other reason is Medicare and some other programs, entitlement programs, are sucking a lot of the income tax dollars out of what we would otherwise maybe want to spend it on. Next slide. Here's, a, in my opinion, again, I, I don't <coughs> attribute this issue to total malfeasance. This is not, if you will, like the meltdown uh, we had in the economy recently where I think people made a lot of bad choices and Congress and presidents uh, did things they probably shouldn't have. This is just biology. I'm a veterinarian. This is biology. 1975, how many people were taking Medicare? 25 million. It's almost doubled now, 2010, and it's going to skyrocket in 2040. Baby boom generation coming home, right? 
baby boomers come home. It's just, you know, no one's fault. Maybe our parents shouldn't have had us, but other than that, it's no one's fault. Yeah, cost per enrollee. Medicine's come a long way, baby. I mean, only, I can't believe $2,000 per enrollee in 1975. That's all it took, on average, to take care of a Medicare. Now, it's nearly 10, and again, scheduled to go through the roof. And we're living longer, theoretically. We're happier, we're healthier. A lot of great medicine. We're able to stay in our homes. Project programs like OPI, that lease fought for for many years, and can help make sure people stay in the home, stay healthy. And that's a wonderful thing, but it costs. If the drugs are expensive, the hospital stays, the new technology. So those two things add up to that huge curve we saw on why Medicare is getting so expensive. And there's another factor, too. Let's, next slide. This is so security, and, and you're, you're, it is correct that it is not part of our debt and deficit. It's not part of that red ink slide. You saw how that blue that represented Social Security was pretty flat. Geez, Kurt, what, why are you talking about it? You make me nervous when you talk about it, you politicians, you know? Well, the reason I'm talking about it is right now, as many of you know, we have a trust fund. There's a surplus. Way over on that left-hand side, that number two, between two and three, that's $2.6 trillion. A lot of money. Well, what's the problem? Problem is, like I showed in the other slide, people are getting older. There's a lot more older people. That trust fund, as of this year, is starting to go down. This year, for the first year in a long time, the revenues going in do not equal the benefits going out. We're paying more out in benefits than we're taking in. And that's going to happen every single year from now until 2036. Actually, it's going to continue beyond 2036. But by 2036, the trust fund is empty. What does that mean? That means only, we can uh, only pay out benefits based on the revenues that are coming in. So if you're on Social Security, you're earning, you know, maybe you're getting a thousand bucks a month. That's probably the average. It's not a lot of money, frankly, for Social Security. It might be the only money, what, 90% of Americans or 50% of Americans have to live on. By 2036, that thousand bucks gets cut 25% because the revenues won't support a thousand buck outlay. So you're going to be having to live on 750 bucks a month. So it's a problem. It's not part of our debt deficit. I agree with you on that. But it is something that I don't want my kids or grandkids not to have some so decent social security benefits so they can at least live with dignity, you know, at their homes. Next slide. And the reason for both, so another reason besides the fact a lot of us are getting older and the cost of medicine is going up, is that there are less people paying into the system. Remember, it's a, it's a pay it forward type thing. You know, I pay... For my parents and grandparents, Social Security, the, the, in other words, it's a payroll tax that funds the seniors' benefits. Back in 1950, with Social Security in play, you had 16 workers for every re retired person. You know, by 1960, it was 5 to 1 when uh, Medicare was come, well, shortly going to come into existence. Now it's 3 to 1, going to go to 2 to 1. So you have less people paying payroll tax to support that huge increase in population that we're having right now. So you got those three big factors, less workers, more people in the system, and the increased cost that is really in danger of bankrupting Medicare as we know it. Next slide. So what are we doing about it? Well, I know you're not doing anything, Kurt. I read about it all the time in the papers. You guys don't do a darn thing. Yeah, you bunch of, you know, the one election talking point after another. I've seen it on CNN and CSBC or whatever it is, Fox News, whatever. Well, I actually are doing some things. Believe it or not, uh, despite all the craziness, and there is a ton of craziness there, uh, in August of last year we passed what we call the Budget Control Act. And what we did is uh, actually make an initial reduction of almost a trillion dollars, $917 billion, in our spending over the next 10 years. And a gentleman at a pre the meeting this morning said, well, Kurt, that's not, you're just reducing the increase. Well, to some extent that's true, but we're also actually making actual decreases. In the 2011 budget, we cut the actual dollar spending level down about 10 or 15 billion dollars. And I think this year, 2012, I think the, don't quote me exactly, but I think the reduction is like three to five billion dollars. That's actual real cuts like you do in a business. Now going forward, if you make those cuts and make some other changes, you can actually reduce the growth enough to get some serious savings. However, that 917 plus the 1.2, remember we had the super committee? Remember that? Super committee failed, miraculously, you know, beautifully or unbeautifully, depending on your point of view. It was terrible. But con Congress, we know how uh, lily livered we are, and so we put in this automatic trigger that says, hey, you know, you guys don't get your act together, we're going to cut a trillion two across the board. Half in defense, 
half in your domestic programs. In other words, share the pain. Depending on what you're, if you like this or like, everyone's going to share the pain. We thought that was a good motivation for the super committee to do something, but apparently not. So we now have a, not, we have that trillion bucks that we did in August. We now have another trillion two that's going to go into effect at the end of this year. It's not a very thoughtful program. It's just across the board. Every single agency takes a proportionate cut. Now, defense gets hit pretty hard because it's defense and then everything else. So everything else shares a little bit of cuts. Defense gets whacked pretty hard. But my point, I guess the main point is, say we got $2 trillion. Geez, that sounds pretty good, Congressman Schrader. I, that's, I guess you're doing better than I thought. Well, maybe we're doing a little better than you thought, but I'll tell you, it's not enough. If we want to prevent Medicare from going through the roof and get our revenues in line with some sort of history, we've actually got to get our national debt, bottom of the page here, national debt has to be down at least 60% of GDP. Well, I'd like it to be zero. But that's going to take a long time. We go to zero overnight, we can't fund anything. Matter of fact, the, the, de de the deficit we've had the last few years, over a trillion dollars, that would wipe out those two, that would wipe out defense and uh, domestic spending altogether. So if we wanted to do it overnight, we're only spending about 700, bil only, $700 billion in defense and uh, 500 some odd billion dollars in domestic programs. That equals our one, almost equals our one year deficit. So you can't just do it. You got to do this over time or you eviscerate our national security as well as some basic programs Americans rely on. But we've got to get to these numbers and our, our annual deficit has to be no more than 3% of GDP. I, I, I'm sorry for the numbers, but when you hear these, you at least have some reference point when people are talking about and other politicians are talking. We're not there. We're actually, uh, with Greece, we're at 9% of GDP in our annual deficit. Now, the President's budget's going to come out on Monday. Supposedly it goes down a little, but it'll go down enough. How do you get to these numbers? If this isn't enough, how do you get to these numbers? Next slide. This is how much you got to cut. So we've almost got to double the cuts we did in August and the automatic cuts that are going, going to go into effect at the end of this year. And that's tough. And the, as you can see, the cost drivers are, this, in my opinion, the historically low revenues and the health care costs that are unsustainable given just the population and the technology we have today. So we need a group of people to dive in where the super committee failed and try and correct that. And there are those of us that are doing that, and I can address that if you want during questions. Next slide. This is just slide. We, the sooner you act, the, it's a, this is common sense, which Congress doesn't really live with too often, but uh, if you act early, you only have to make a minor change in what you're doing. We act now, 2012, we make a 5% change in all these different program areas. Everyone shares a little sacrifice. We could probably get this done. If you wait till 2025, you wait another 10 years, basically, or 10, 13 years, and it's a 12 or 13% change. The longer you wait, the deeper the cut has to be and the harder it is on the people and, the, and our kids and grandkids to, to, to have the life and quality of life, enjoy any type of job security. Next slide. I believe that one of the big things, since we're not really, I'm not a small businessman in Washington, D.C. I was a small businessman in my veterinary clinic. I'm the guy that hires people. And I need a strong nation, a strong economy, for me to feel comfortable about investing in it. Buying new machinery, hiring somebody, thinking that my output, I, I need a demand. I need demand. Well, I'm not going to invest in this country, especially if I'm a bigger or middle-sized business, unless I have confidence this country is not going to fail, not going to end up like Greece. So I believe that the super committee actually uh, had done its work, and frankly, this new group, uh, the go we call ourselves the Go Big group, gets its act together, we get this $4 trillion in revenues and spending reductions, that will inspire a lot of business leaders, we've talked to a lot of business leaders around the country, to actually begin to make investments in our country. Last slide. You know, and there's other things we're doing too. I mean, we're not relying just on this. I'm working with uh, Greg and Peter uh, on trying to put some people back to work in the woods, as you well know. The transportation plan's coming up for discussion next week. Uh, that's not going so well. It's usually a big bipartisan thing that we do, one of the few big bipartisan things. It's now got locked in partisan gridlock, but so we'll see what happens there. And we actually had, the other good thing we did do is we actually had some uh, uh, export agreements uh, ratified by bipartisan majorities this past year so that we can actually uh, sell American goods to somebody else and uh, boost our American manufacturing. And I think the President's going to talk about that too. So 
with that, uh, that's kind of the state of the union from Kurt Schrader's standpoint. Some tough choices ahead of us, and uh, we're going to have to cowboy up and, and make these choices if we're going to have a, a country that has a, a, a good job future and a good economic future to compete with the rest of the world. So we'll start with that, and then we'll get into questions. Okay, we'll start with questions. I guess you guys put tickets in, and they draw a ticket, and your ticket comes up. You ask your question. What are the last three again? Oh, zero, four, one. I, I don't have any questions. Okay. I have, but... Go ahead. Well, the Medicare stuff. I'm on SSI. I get the lowest amount possible. And they keep taking away our dental work and our eyeglasses, I have to pay my out of my Social Security check for these kind, the kind of glasses I'm wearing now. And I can't see through them anymore. And every time some kind of budget crisis comes up, they do this to us. And, and not to mention the homeless people. So... No, I think you're, that's a very good point. You're a good example, uh, unfortunately, of what happens when we have all, you know, more demand uh, than we can take care of. That same thing in our school system. The, well, the class sizes have gotten huge, and we've got to make sure we got to make sure that we have at least a chance of providing you with basic services, whether it's dental or eye. How do you expect a person to get a job? If they've lost all their teeth and stuff. It's very tough. So we've got to find a way to keep these programs going. Uh, I'm not a big privatization guy. I'll tell you guys that up front. I think we can uh, incentivize. Uh, I like Medicare Advantage where there's uh, incentives. Uh, but there's ways to go about this thoughtfully. Uh, not by just restricting services because we can't afford them anymore. Because that's, a, that's going down the wrong way. What we can do is do some cost sharing. We can actually be smart about uh, how we deliver health care. And there's actually, a, if like or hate the health care bill, one of the nice things supposedly coming out in 2014 is that we're going to change the reimbursement system based on good outcomes, not just one procedure after another. And that should hopefully keep a lot more money in the system to keep you guys healthy and provide some basic benefits. 691053. 053. And you don't have to ask questions, I guess, if you don't want. How about 161582? Must have been my staff that picked all those out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of fighting for both of those. <laughs> we'll get to you in a hurry, apparently. How about 161593? Five nine three. Not doing too good, Mr. Mayor. How about six nine one zero four six? Uh, Close. I think I have. Left. All right. Yay. Young lady at the back. Um, hi, my name is Lindsay Perry. I am with the Marion County Democrats, um, and I want to say thank you very much for being here. Um, this is my first. Chance of actually meeting you, quote unquote. Um, anyway, I don't necessarily have a question. A lot of this is still new to me. I just moved here from Maine, so what Oregon is doing in their politics. Is Welcome. Good. Thank you. And um, what is the, your, what do you call it, the big something that you're doing? Go big. Your go big. What is that going to do differently than the super committee did? Uh, how are they not going to fail? Good, good. That's a good question. Thank you for the question, actually. Uh, uh, Go Big is a group of 145 uh, members of Congress. That's out of 535, right? Senate's 100, House is 435. So there's 145 of us that have signed a letter to our respective leaders, uh, both in the House and in the Senate, to say we need to do something close to $4 trillion, Mr. Senate President, Mr. Speaker of the House. And uh, we actually have... Uh, uh, a bill we're drafting, because the this, this Senate President said, that's fan that, thanks, Kurt, I appreciate all your happy talk, I think was the term he used. Thanks for all the happy talk, but I want to see you draft a bill. 
I want to see you sign your name on the bill. It's one thing to draft a letter. But I want to see you sign a bill that makes the tough decisions. You know, so we're actually doing that. You know, we're, 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 he called our bluff, so we're going to do it. We're going to say, okay, we're going to write. So theoretically, to your answer, to answer your question, uh, over the next couple months, uh, well, we're already doing it actually, but it's taken. It's going to take a while. The scope of things we're talking about here. So uh, hopefully by late spring. We'll actually have legislation that talks about a solution that encompasses making sure that the social support systems, our safety net, is in place for future generations as well as present seniors, that uh, there's adequate revenues in the system, uh, that looks at some of the spending that we've been doing in the wars and other, frankly, areas where we can make some cuts, and put it on paper. And I hope at that point that uh, all 145 of us will sign our name to that also and that we will be petitioning uh, the Senate President and the Speaker of the House to give us an up or down vote on that at the end of the day. To, why would we be successful? Uh, uh, I wouldn't bet the ranch on it, uh, but I would bet that there's some things out there. That some of my colleagues are coming to grips with the, the cuts of the defense budget I talked about. You know, we don't have a lot of defense bases in Oregon, but it's a big deal whether you're a Republican or Democrat in almost every other bloody state in the Union. And my senators in particular, back east, are and down south, are infuriated that the defense budget is going to take any more cuts. They are apoplectic about it. But having said that, the president has clearly said, I'm going to let these automatic cuts go into play unless you guys come up with a better solution. We've got to address this issue. The other thing is the tax cuts, the Obama-Bush tax cuts, are set to expire at the end of this year. I talked about that earlier. You know, the president, I don't think, is... You know, he upped them last time. I don't think he's going to up if he's even whether he's a president or not. It could be tough to up those things and get that through Congress. I think that's going to be a real problematic. So I think there's incentive to be smart about it and do the right thing. Good question. Thank you. Yep. Next one, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one six one five eight zero. Five eight zero. How about one six one five nine two? Five nine two. This is a get along kind of group here. <laughs> How about not everyone wants to ask a question, that's fine. Six nine one zero four three. Maybe that was the roll from Candy. Yeah, right. <laughs> the red box here. Six nine one zero four nine. Zero four nine. Zero four nine. Five seventy eight. Five seven eight. Maybe better. I'll take that. Just you people. So I mean, just answer. Yeah. Sure, we can do that. Now we get in trouble. <laughs> Go for the white ones. Okay. Zero four five. Bingo. All right. We got a winner. Yay! Yay. You get to pay extra taxes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make a deal. Yeah. Let's make a deal. Hi, Vern. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to get your uh, your opinion on the uh, notion of a uh, federal consumption tax, a federal sales tax. We just said 50 percent of Americans don't pay taxes. So. I understand the poverty level, but and then we have the higher ups that are not paying any taxes. So what, what what's your opinion on that? Well, I think we have to come up with some sort of reform proposal that has that has buy-in. But what I do think, and and the most a lot of European nations have a value-added tax. It's a, a consumption-type tax that apparently they've come accustomed to, and that's fine. And you can you actually could lower. I did some work here in the state legislature, as you know. Uh, to try and come up with, if we did a little bit of a consumption tax, so everyone paid some, you could still make it progressive, so it wasn't hitting the poor uh, in a uh, uh, punitive way. Uh, you can actually lower other rates. You can lower income tax rates, maybe even capital gains to get business to invest. One of the big things they're talking about right now in Congress is a tax reform piece that deals pretty much still with just the income tax. But what they, remember we talked about all the tax breaks, the trillion dollars that we give away. Some of that's okay, you know, some of that would be preserved, I'm sure. We're trying to keep the housing industry going, for instance. But if you got rid of most all of those, you know, saved almost a trillion dollars instead of giving it away in tax breaks, you save that money in the system to pay for stuff. You could actually buy down the debt dramatically 
and have a little bit left over for some programs. You actually put a trillion dollars in the system, you could lower everybody's tax rate. So uh, the average lower income tax rate goes from 15 down to about eight. Uh, if you're in the 20 some or 25 percent tax break or tax bracket, uh, your rate would go down to about 15. And even if you're at the 33, 36 rate, your rate could go down to 28, 27. And if you lower the corporate rate, which sounds almost counterintuitive, you can, you can still get this money in the system to get our revenues back up, at least somewhat where they were historically. And I've talked to a lot of big business folks uh, and medium-sized business folks. They love this idea. They're clamoring for us to do this. I said, well, you know, GE, you're going to pay some taxes here. You're not going to get away with no taxes. I talked to a big oil and gas firm that's in Houston, I guess, and they get all these depletion, depletion allowances, you know, accelerated depreciation, leasing, all sorts of tax rates. So you, they're all going away, man. You okay with this? They say, yes, we are, Kurt. I was shocked. I was really pretty shocked. So I'm thinking, wow, we got all these business folks kind of interested in this, and if we lowered the rates for the small business folks, you know, we pay through our income, ta our individual rates, if you're sub S corp or partnership or sole proprietor like I was in my vet clinic. I like that. I like having something where I have to pay an army of accountants an, an arm and a leg, no offense if you're an accountant out there, to uh, get my taxes done. So there are some thoughtful reform proposals. Uh, I'm open to pretty much any of them that don't get us hung up on this whole class warfare. I just don't think lobbying, you know, one unacceptable proposal after another to the other side is what you all want us to do. You want us to solve the problem. I have a follow-up check. I have okay. two tickets. Okay. <laughs> uh, Oregon veterans need your help. We've talked about this yep. issue. Uh, ten years ago, my public law uh, Congress uh, instructed the Portland, or the VA system here in Oregon, including the Portland VA, to to make chiropractic services yep. available to all veterans. And it's, it hasn't happened. They haven't done anything. They've hired one or three up in the uh, Seattle area, full-time chiropractic physicians, and our veterans continue to be un, uh, unserved. We have the Healing Hands for Heroes, and we have chiropractic for our troops, and, and it's a network of docs that are donating their services, but it shouldn't be that way. Right. So um, we have a House Joint Memorial that passed through the House. Uh, it's headed over to Senator Brian Boyquist's committee, who's, it was his idea, so I think we're not going to have much trouble. Good. We're going to have, we want to hand deliver it uh, with uh, um, yourself, uh, at least on the phone. Sure. In, in district, uh, and we'd like your help, uh, Congressman Blumenauer and both senators. Uh, uh, are very interested in helping yeah. with industry staff, mm -hmm. and so I, I'd like your commitment to at least be on the phone yeah. when we meet with the director. Absolutely, great. not a problem. Great, great program. Uh, you guys are part of how we make healthcare uh, less costly and more effective at the end of the day, and I appreciate you stepping up. The dental community has also stepped up, chiropractic, a lot of groups have stepped up and uh, made big sacrifices, frankly, uh, because they, they, they want to be part of this, the cure, frankly. Uh, so I appreciate that very much. About zero three six. Zero three six. There we go, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> I'll brag a little bit. I was a strong supporter when you're Oregon legislature, and I backed you for firmly when you're back in Washington D.C. But I, I, I want to thank you and Peter DeFazio and Walden for your timber bill. But there's an SJM 201-1 going through the Oregon legislature. Incidentally, it was introduced by two Republican senators. And I hope, I hope that that letter gets to you because I gave you copies of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. But one, one thing that you, you, haven't, you haven't really talked about, and I'd love to see in all these slides, just slide around the sides and put jobs, jobs, jobs. We've got to get My staff people, says the same got, thing, Lee. We've got to get people back to work. Yeah, we do. We do. Some, some way or other. And that's JM, if that passes, it goes through Congress, and our temporary interest comes back where it used to be. It's a strong, strong supporter in Oregon. Well, thanks. So, thanks. But, but you casually passed over Oregon Project, but I can't. If, yeah, the other, if the other 49 states had that same type of a program, we wouldn't be near in debt as we are now. Well, at least talking about uh, the House, uh, the Oregon uh, state legislatures, uh, getting a memorial together to support what uh, Greg Walton, Peter Fazio, and I are doing to try and put people back to work in the woods in an environmentally friendly manner. Uh, we create new wilderness. Our idea, we're talking to uh, staff, so we're, we're not sure how far we're going to get with this thing, but 
our idea was we create some wilderness areas, separate the ONC lands into two pieces, one for you know, uh, old growth and the other for uh, the counties to help support, frankly, their community with uh, sustainable logging practices uh, that are fair. And so uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to push that through. Uh, we're, we're in some very heated discussions right now uh, with uh, uh, committee staff to see if we can't get that bill out of committee. That would create a lot of jobs, just a lot of jobs, and revitalize rural America, uh, whether you're in state or up the canyon a little bit further. Those are the communities that are not going to be high-tech, software, you know, genius communities. They don't have that, that resource base. we got to get them back to work and use our natural resources uh, the way the good Lord intended, in my opinion. About 048. Very good. Very good, finally. John Taggart from Amsville. Hey, John. Uh, good to meet you. Uh, I've got a whole list of things, but let's start with how come out here in the woods, so to speak, we hear zero conversation coming out of Congress about taking the 106 cap off to fund Social Security. It seems like an easy solution. And, and we should at least get some conversation on it. I agree. Uh, that's a good comment. You know, we talk about Social Security, trust fund going, we don't want those cuts. How do you, what do you do to fix that? One of the ideas that's been talked about a lot is, as you know, payroll only up to $106,800 is taxed for Social Security. Money above that isn't taxed. You get to pocket that, okay? And there's a big discussion, well, let's just raise capital. And I think that has some horsepower. However, there are a lot of folks in Congress, a lot of elected folks in this big country of ours that don't want to take it all the way up. I don't know what the rationale is necessarily. Well, I'll say this. The way it was originally set up, 90% of America's payroll was supposed to be subject to Social Security tax. That was the way it was originally set up. Right now, interestingly enough, we're only at 83% of the payroll. Uh, that's, so it's eroded. If we were just to get back up to the 90% of payroll, that would add a bunch to the system. And if you tweak it, uh, right now Social Security is already means tested. If we tweak the means testing a little bit more, that would save some money and put money in the system. And, uh, you know, retirement age is 67 for, for me. It's not 65. I'm you know, old, but I guess not that old, so I'm up to 67. If you tweaked it over the next 65 years, the Debt Commission did this. If you tweak it to 69 over the next 65 years, in other words, you know, phasing in a month at a time, you could save a bunch more money. You do those three fixes, and you fix Social Security. So it's almost a no-brainer. You could do that stuff. So, but people are afraid to talk about it. I'm one of the few. There's probably a handful of politicians in America, literally right now, that are talking to you like I am. They're all afraid to talk about it. They think you guys are not smart. I have to think you're pretty smart. And I think you need to know this stuff, and you need to talk to people like me and others, friends of yours in other states, say, man, you'll be, be talking about this, man. you got to fix this. Ms. Mayor. 044. Zero 044. Zero four. Four. That was my Burns a team player. 042. Here. 042. Good to see you again. Hi, Kurt. Yeah, Mike Brady. I'm a family doc, and I've... Lobbied you before on, yep. on our House of Medicine issues, and I promise I won't ask about the doc things. It's all right. So, uh, um, kind of a comment and a, and a concern. Um, I also am on the board of uh, the food bank, okay. and um, I know the Farm Bill is coming up. I know you're on the Agriculture uh, Committee, and, and I think just speaking for a lot of hunger advocates, I, I hope Congress will. Um, Form this what we call circle of protection around the prog programs like uh, SNAP and, and the WIC program uh, that have done so much for uh, poor people. Sure, sure. So um, my concern uh, bridges medicine and hunger issues. Um, I have a little bone to pick with the USDA. Um, so in the SNAP program, um, uh, it, it pays four billion dollars a year for soda. Um, uh, obesity is a, uh, you know, is the epidemic, it, you know, threatens uh, American financial security and the health of the population more than anything I've seen in my 35 years of medicine. And a lot of people want to work on that program, and we'd like to think that agencies like the USDA were on our side. 
uh, eight or nine times now, states have applied for waivers to, on a pilot program basis, eliminate soda and see if it can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And every single time, USDA has turned them down. Huh. So, okay. I, you know, I, I'd like to think again that the USDA would respond more to, to this need than the needs of the American beverage industry, which I suspect uh, is behind that opposition. Do you have any comments about that? Um, a lot of attention on just that, you know, the obesity epidemic. I think everyone in this room and America knows that, uh, unfortunately, we're becoming increasingly unfit in the younger generation. We were talking about this yesterday as I was traveling around the district of fast foods all over the place. I just came from a fast food place. And, uh, you know, but uh, it used to be a day where you sat down at the dinner table and you had a home-cooked meal that was made out of, you know, reasonably good stuff. Uh, and that's not so much the case anymore. Fast food's gotten very inexpensive and people are allowed to use their food, their SNAP money, used to be food stamps, uh, to buy that stuff. Uh, the hard part is figuring out where to draw these lines, you know, uh, where, you know, anymore you go in the grocery store, you know, is it organic or natural, is it 80%, 90% of this, that, it's tough. And uh, I guess USDA labor is under that. I'll take the message back though, Mike. I, I, I am concerned enough and, you know, whatever you think about the health care bill, there are now provisions going into private insurance plans, irrespective of the health care bill, to incentivize healthier lifestyles. You know, uh, you can base it on caloric intake, you can base it on working out, you can base it on smoking, alcohol, just, you know, all that stuff. And uh, Americans respond not so well to a lot of things, but they do respond to monetary issues. You know, if you're not going to pay... Uh, uh, benefits uh, because you're uh, getting a bad lifestyle or you're going to reduce someone's premium if they, you know, watch what they eat or drink, I think there's some great opportunities there. Uh, and maybe we could have a conversation with uh, the beverage industry. We had that with the pharmaceutical industry about, you know, cutting, you know, the, some of the cost of medications to seniors. This past year I was reading, it was like $1.6 billion that seniors saved uh, because uh, the pharmaceutical industry has it's kind of stepped up and paying 50% of the cost of brand name drugs for seniors that fall into that, that donut hole. So we can have the same conversation probably with the beverage industry and hopefully, hopefully incentivize these guys to do it, do the right thing. Thanks for your concern about that. about 050? 050. Zero zero? Zero zero. Uh, these white tickets are working for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Carnes. Um, my name is Bob Smith. Uh, I live in Pacific Northwest, come back to roost after retirement. Spent 51 years in the construction industry. And uh, in the construction industry <clears throat> until I was 71. So I have some questions, obviously, now that I'm one of the seniors. Sure. Sure. <laughs> For a long time I've been a senior. Uh, our debit keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. And <clears throat> when the word budget comes up, like it is now, every year, the first thing we hear is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And oh my God, the sky's full. So I ask you, uh, what is the status on the repayment? Is there a program from the $2.5 trillion that the federal government has lifted out of the Social Security Fund and used for other programs? Yep. And they left a hand or a bucket full of IOUs that are supposedly um, backed by Treasury bonds. And my question to you is, what is your response to fixing that? Because we, we're in trouble now. Right. 2036 is the deadline that looks like it's on the, on the chart. Mm -hmm. So, yep. what, what, what's going to happen? Or well, why, well, does it, why does it keep getting ignored? Sure, sure. Well, I, I, it shouldn't be ignored, uh, to your point. I mean, we've already borrowed all that money. That money's already been spent. You know, it's only backed like every other program we're borrowing for by the full faith and credit of the United States government. That government 
whose national debt is continuing to increase exponentially. We're up to almost 15 plus trillion dollars in total debt. It'll go to 16 probably sometime after the first of the year. So those IOUs are not worth very much, to be honest, unless we get this pattern under control. We have to at least reduce the rate of spending, come up with some reasonable revenues, so that we can pay that back. Now, I'll just say this. This is an editorial comment. You're my constituents. You know, they're all this, they're arguing in Washington, D.C. right now about the payroll tax. You know, should we continue that cut? Well, that, that, that payroll tax we just talked about, that pays for Medicare. That pays for Social Security. Okay? Now, they're not cutting the Medicare piece. That's a pretty small piece of your payroll tax. But they're, for, for the last four years, we have not been paying into Social Security like we're supposed to. Ostensibly, it was done while we're going to stimulate the economy. Well, I don't. What we're doing is we're spending your retirement today. I spent for a six point two percent for a long time. That's right. And now people aren't paying four point two. I think it's that number. You know, oh, that's great. I'd like to have some extra money in my pocket, but not at the, not at, not sacrifice in my kids' future. So we're actually going the wrong way with this. Pay my, I'm going to vote against the payroll tax cut. Yeah, just so you know, because of that very reason. It's a, I think it's, uh, you know, frankly, duplicitous of me to come and talk about how much trouble we're in. And they go, oh, yeah, I'm going to vote for that cut for, you know, Social Security. I'm not going to pay it. So we can't do that. I will say this, though. They did pass a bill before it got to Congress where they can't borrow against it anymore. It's not gone, you know, but they can't borrow it against it anymore. But we have to get this big picture under control, and that's how you pay that back so that there's actually something there for folks when their retirement comes. I have have one, one last one on the same thing. Okay. Medicare. Uh, Social Security, Medicare are payroll deductions. Right. Out of the employee's uh, check each week. Uh, when has Medicare money and Social Security been put in one fund together? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the question was, you know, are they in one fund? I don't actually know the answer to that. The problem is, up until recently, all those funds were fungible. I know there's a, a, the law says that special interest funds like Social Security, I'd assume it would include Medicare, cannot be borrowed against. I think they're two separate funds, though. I don't think they're all part of the same thing. The problem with Medicare is, you know, we're, we're borrowing to pay for Medicare. You know, at this stage, like my slide showed. And we, it's, unfortunately, as Medicare gets more expensive and there are more of us in it, that borrowing chunk's going to get bigger because the revenues, obviously, are unsustainable to keep it going. Regulating the prescription people would do a big wonder. And we did a little of that, actually, in the health care bill, too. Well, they need to be turned upside down. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Our last question is, uh, will be coming from 039. 039. Ah, gentleman in the back. Good to see you. Gene Ditter from Sublimity. On transportation, or actually all the infrastructures, any of the money that you get from the federal government seems to have a lot of administrative rules and restrictions. Yeah, exactly. And by the time you jump through all the hoops, you have a very little amount that you can work on your project. Is there any way to make it easier um, to decrease the administrative rules that you have to follow? I mean, put in place? but also uh, get rid of the fluff, because a lot of the projects that are done have um, so much extra that if you want this money, you have to do this, right, this, and this. Right, right, right. Which, right now, doesn't make sense. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, hopefully, we're one of the bipartisan things uh, that we are trying to work on that would hopefully create jobs is this transportation infrastructure bill. We can't seem to get quite as much horsepower about water and sewer, which are also big deals for sublimity, state, and you, know, you name it. Um, but uh, the regulations, I tell you, I mean, we thought, you know, some of these bills we write are pretty darn long. I think they're pretty explicit, and I thought we did that for a reason, so that we didn't need all these extra rules. It'd be pretty self-evident, but uh, the people that actually write the rules, there's, there's legislation, you know, there's laws that we pass, and then there are, uh, how do you actually implement them, then there's rules that are written by the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., and I know they mean well, but sometimes they have an agenda of their own. And to the mayor's point, I was talking to the uh, head of the Port of Portland, and he said easily 30% of every project they do is to deal just with environmental and other types of regulations. 
Now, 50 years ago, we didn't have that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have some regulation. I mean, we need to protect the environment. But I mean, they've gotten so complex and Byzantine. We are actually passing legislation. It's one of the things we are, uh, at least I'm voting bipartisanly, to reduce some of the excess regulations. Boiler Mac is a big one. They're trying to restrict uh, some of the uh, uh, output, if you will, for some of the boilers. Uh, and some of that's fine, but the regulations would put almost all of our boilers out of practice in Oregon right now. So we are pushing back to on a wait. You know, maybe at some point that'd be appropriate, but not now while the country's you know, starving to death, you know, losing their homes. We've got to make sure that with the little bit of money we give you, you can do what you need to do with it. So I'll take that back. Uh, it's good to hear that my local communities feel the same way. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you spending a nice Saturday doing it here. Thanks.